What is that Magog thing all about? Well, it's actually found in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 2. The Bible says the descendants of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Medai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. Magog, according to the Bible, was the son of Japheth and a grandson of someone many of you would know by the name of Noah. We know historically that Magog's descendants settled to the far north of Israel, likely in Europe and northern Asia. In Ezekiel 38 and verse 2, the Bible said, Son of man, turn and face Gog of the land of Magog, the prince who rules over the nations of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Again, Gog is a man, Magog is a land. The name of the individual Magog, Noah's grandson, evolved into the land of Magog, referring to the landmass due north of Israel, occupied by his descendants. And I make no bones about it. I don't believe it's debatable. There's only one nation and landmass due north of Israel in the distant north, and that is the land of Russia. These descendants of Magog, sometimes referred to as northern barbarians, are described in the Bible as skilled warriors and a mighty army by this prophet Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 38, verses 14 and 15, Ezekiel said, You will come from your homeland in the distant north with your vast cavalry and your mighty army. Approximately 25 Hundred years ago, the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel prophesied that in the distant future, and again, we know that this hasn't happened yet, so I believe it's in the near future. It was in the distant future for Ezekiel, but it's in the near future for us. And he prophesied that Gog, a man, and Magog, a land, along with a coalition of allied nations, would descend from the north upon peaceful Israel like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. The Bible tells us that that military coalition will use the dried up Euphrates River as a military highway as a part of their strategic war plan. The Bible prophesied that God would cause the Euphrates River to dry up to make just such a path. And guess which river has dried up in the last couple of years? In Ezekiel 38, verses 8 and 9, the Bible said, A long time from now you will be called into action. In the distant future you will swoop down on the land of Israel. I'm always amazed, though I've been a student of Bible prophecy basically my whole life. My father, as many of you know, was a pastor. He pastored for 63 years before he went home to be with the Lord. My mother's 91 years old and still alive. And by the way, needs prayer. But the Bible remarkably foretold. And I remember as a child, my father used to bring in some eschatology teachers and Bible prophecy teachers. And though I was a child, I remember distinctly thinking, this means that the Bible's provable. Because, you know, as a kid, sometimes you have a prove-it-to-me attitude. And sometimes parents make the mistake of telling their kids, I'll tell you why, because I told you why. But if you're going to raise kids with an IQ above room temperature, let me give you some advice. Pay attention to kids that ask a lot of questions. It's usually the sign of a high IQ and leadership and training. And don't be so busy or so arrogant as a, as a parent that when your kid asks you a question that you get upset and you're a little short in patience because you had a bad day and you snap at the kid and say, you don't ask me why I'm your parent. It's just true because I told you so. Well, I don't know that I'd call that good parenting. You don't want to stifle children from asking questions as long as they have the right attitude. Now, believe me, all children need an attitude adjustment from time to time. I won't go down that highway. But especially when it comes to your kids asking you questions about the Bible. 
Because the Bible said in the book of James that you should always be ready to give a valid answer to those who ask about your faith. From the Greek word, give an apologia, which is where we get the word apologetic. Give a provable, understandable, systematic answer because that's how kids process stuff. And as a little boy, those prophecy teachers that my father used to bring in, I remember as a kid sitting in the front row as they taught prophecy thinking, the Bible's believable. The Bible's provable. Prophecies are a way of knowing that the Bible was not just men writing stuff impulsively, but indeed God in prophetic chronology put the pieces of the Bible together. Bible remarkably foretold, don't miss this, that in the end times, if you switched off, switch back on right now. Don't miss this. The Bible in Ezekiel's Magog prophecy, Gog and Magog prophecy, in Ezekiel 38 and 39 said, here's how you'll know this is about to happen. You will see an aggressive leader rise up out of the land of Magog, which geographically was defined the distant north of Israel. Moscow is almost 1,200 miles plus, due north of Jerusalem, off by about four degrees. But there is no other landmass that fulfills this. So Ezekiel, almost 2,500 years ago, said, here's how you'll know it's almost over. An aggressive leader will rise up out of what we know as Russia with a passion and a lust to reestablish what we might refer to in modern language as the Russian Empire. And whoever this Gog is will not only push for the revival of that empire, he will eventually ally nations together to assault Israel. We all know why they need their wealth. They need their minerals. They need their oil. They need their magnesium and on and on and on. One of the greatest wealth in all of the world is located in the land of Israel and not accidentally. But the Bible says before Russia and this northern coalition attacks Israel, there's three biblical requirements that have to be fulfilled. If you're taking notes, let me give them to you. First, the Bible said Israel must be present in her land. That was not possible after A.D. 70 until May 14, 1948, when God prophetically began to put his promise to Israel into final Bible prophecy mode. For over 2,000 years, the Jewish people were scattered all over the world, living among Gentiles, because there was no longer a Jewish nation. But 1948, that all changed. Israel became a nation, was reborn, and many Jews began to return to their homeland. So the first prophetic prerequisite for the invasion of Russia has already been fulfilled. Israel occupies her land. Three reasons. Here's number two. Second, Israel must not only be present in her land, the Bible prophesied she must be prof prosperous in her land. Ezekiel prophesied that when the Jewish people return to their homeland, God will bless them beyond anything they've known in their entire history. And Ezekiel 36 and 11 describes Israel's wealth this way. Ezekiel said in the 36th chapter in the 11th verse, I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young, and I will make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you than at your beginnings. The modern fulfillment of this prophecy is evident in Israel's thriving economy, which, by the way, has been ranked as the world's third most innovative behind Finland and Switzerland and just ahead of Japan and the United States. Israel economically is blowing it out of the water like never before in their history. Almost every major invention has been invented by Jews in Jerusalem. Time doesn't afford me to go down the list. 
cell phones, computers. I mean, you could just go down the list of everything that's changed the world in modern history, and it's traced back to some Jewish individual or Jewish corporation in Jerusalem. And then third, the Bible said Israel must be at peace in her land. And that is not so, because if you were to visit Israel today, you'll see all of the young people walking around with guns slung over their shoulders everywhere you go. They're always on alert because they know they could be attacked by the neighboring nations at any given moment. Rockets by the hundreds are fired and directed into Israel every single day. The military miracle of technology that the world wishes they could uncover that secret called the Iron Dome keeps that land impenetrable. Why? Well, part of that is God promised to protect them until this is all fulfilled. Ezekiel 38 and verse 11 describes a markedly different Israel. The Bible says that God will go up against the land of unwalled villages. Currently, Israel is completely walled in. Do you know how many immigrants snuck into Israel in the past year? Zero. Do you know how many immigrants snuck into Israel the year before that? Zero. Do you know how many immigrants snuck into Israel the year before that? Zero. And I could continue ad nauseum. They are a walled nation with secure borders for obvious reasons. Their leaders have common sense. But Ezekiel prophesied, don't miss it, Ezekiel prophesied that when God invades them, it will be a land of unwalled villages invading a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, Ezekiel prophesied. So when Russia and this northern coalition attacks Israel in the near future, Israel is going to willingly do away with all of their protection. That's difficult to imagine. This radical shift in Israel, lowering her defenses, seems almost impossible. But we know from the Bible why politically this is going to happen. Because the Bible said they are going to be seduced by a charismatic one-world leader who will talk them into a seven-year experimental peace treaty and that seven years defined in the scripture, we understand as Daniel's 70th week of seven, which is the great tribulation period, they will voluntarily, with hope, trust in that treaty and agree. At the time of the rapture, the Antichrist will successfully pen that peace treaty. By the way, we know exactly when the tribulation begins. Exactly. Daniel 11 tells us the exact moment that the seven-year tribulation begins. It begins the moment that that one world leader that the scripture calls the Antichrist sits probably at a political negotiated table on world media and signs that seven-year peace treaty. As his pen touches the paper of that seven-year treaty, whatever that date is, that is the exact day that the tribulation begins and the Bible tells us the exact day that the tribulation ends because Daniel prophesied it'll be a set of seven by Hebraic calendar which is 360 days. So the tribulation will last exactly seven times 360 days. A Hebrew year. Well, why is that important? Bible prophecy tells us not only the day that the tribulation begins because we know that the tribulation is ended by the second coming of Christ, Zechariah 14 and 4, we know the exact day of the second coming of Christ. That's why we know that there has to be a rapture because if there were no rapture, then the Bible would contradict itself because it says concerning the rapture, no man knoweth the day. 
nor the hour that the Son of Man will return. So that verse is not talking about the second coming. We know the second coming. It'll be exactly seven times 360 after the day the peace treaty is signed. I'm not looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a part of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture is Jesus coming for the church. The second coming is Jesus Christ returning with the church. And we will rule and reign forever and forever world without end can I hear a mighty Alaska praise hallelujah Israel will let down her guard thinking that they finally have peace the Bible says when they cry out peace and safety sudden destruction will come upon them Wow. I'm going to have to discipline myself to stop right here and get into the second part. Please know that this is not an exhaustive study on Ezekiel 38 and 39. But at least I've given you all of the fundamentals of that prophecy. And it's soon to come. But there's another Gog and Magog in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, that is totally and uniquely distinct. Now, you can understand that the common student of Scripture or the brand new believer who's reading through the Bible and they, they hear a preacher talk about it, and if this helps some of you, and I, I, don't want to, uh, I'm, I don't want to make fun of anybody in ministry, but I've heard a lot of well-known ministries that didn't know the difference between the Gog and Magog event of Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the Gog and Magog event of Revelation 20. I've heard many distinguished ministries mix those up as if they're the same. But if you don't understand how distinctly different these are, then it completely befuddles the chronology of end time events. How many of you know that God does everything in decency and in order? So turn to Revelation chapter 20 with me and we'll conclude with this. The second Gog and Magog battle, if you're taking notes. Revelation 20, beginning to read at verse 7, reading down through verse 10, again out of the New Living Translation. When the thousand years come to an end, that thousand year period is called the millennium, which is one of the 14 major final events in the chronology of final Bible prophecy. And it's a literal thousand years because every time it's referenced, it's referenced as a thousand years. Let me give you a rule for interpreting Bible prophecy. Always interpret the Bible literally when the Bible is literal. Because there are times that the Bible is not literal. As Ezekiel said, in a long time from now, in the distant future, he didn't give us a specific date or time or tell us exactly what. He didn't give us something literal where you could sit down and map out exactly when. But when the Bible is literal, take it, literal a thousand literal years when the thousand years the millennium comes to an end satan will be let out of his prison when at the end of the millennium verse 8 he will go out to deceive the nations called gog and magog in every corner of the earth he will gather them together for battle a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore and I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people in the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. If you're taking notes, verse 7. When the thousand years comes to an end, Satan will be let out of prison. Satan is released at the end of the millennium to lead a final revolt against God. He will gather together all of the ungodly. Listen carefully. During the millennium, though the believers have returned with Christ in the second coming, the world will continue to be populated by the surviving humanity 
which will still have habitation of ungodly, rebellious people. Believers are going to be in charge. We will rule and reign during the millennium, but there are still people giving birth to ungodly kids, and they themselves are ungodly. People ask, why does God allow Satan to get out of prison at the end of the millennium? The Bible's not definitive on that, and I don't believe that a proper teacher or professor or theologian or scholar should be dogmatic when the Bible's not dogmatic. But what seems to happen is God almost uses Satan like a magnet. Prior to the final judgment, prior to the beginning of his eternal kingdom, it seems that he releases Satan Satan on the earth, almost like a magnet, organizes all of the ungodly, brings them all together, all out of the shadows. They reveal themselves. He pumps them up, unites them for a final war against the righteous. His rebellion has not changed from the time he was cast out of heaven like lightning and fell to this earth to the final judgment at the end of the millennium. It reveals to us that his character is unchanged and the character of fallen humanity is unchanged he's released at the end of the thousand year prison sentence to lead one final revolt against God and it reveals to us two things God allows all to see both godly and ungodly that Satan has not changed has not repented And that the heart of humanity is still desperately wicked when it rebels against God. The great prophet Jeremiah prophesied that. He said, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Wickedness just keeps going unrestrained. Did you hear me? Wickedness has no end. Unrestrained wickedness just continues. To grow like a cancer. Đúng không? Quy đạo của nó chính là bằng cái đoạn này và cái đoạn này chính là 2 a. Như vậy tìm a các bạn lấy quy đạo chia 2, 10 chia cho 2 được 5. Được chưa? Và lưu ý biên độ của chúng ta luôn luôn là số dương. Các bạn không được chọn đáp án là trừ 5 nha. Bài số 2 một chiếc điểm dao động điều hòa trong 10 dao động toàn phần đi được quãng đường là 120 giây. Tính quy đạo chuyển động. Hỏi quý đạo chuyển động, uh, quý đạo của dao động có chiều dài là bao nhiêu? Thì như cái câu trên á, thầy đã nói rồi, trong một dao động, trong một dao động thì quãng đường nó đi được luôn là 4A. Như vậy ở đây suy ra trong 10 dao động toàn phần, đúng không ạ? Các bạn nhân lên 10 nhân 4, được chưa? 10 nhân cho 4A, tức là 40A này. Và đề bài người ta cho mình biết quãng đường nó dài 120 Vậy từ đây các bạn suy ra A được đơn giản đi nó ra là 3cm Được chưa? Nhưng bài toán người ta không hỏi về biên độ mà người ta hỏi quý đạo Như vậy tức là cái đoạn A đến trừ A này Vậy các bạn nhân đôi lên 2 nhân 3 là 6 Do đó câu số 2 này chúng ta sẽ chọn đáp án A Được chưa? Rồi tiếp tục các bạn qua câu số 3 thử xem coi nó như thế nào đây một chất điểm dao động điều hòa với phương trình như màn hình của các bạn quan sát đó. Ly độ của vật khi pha dao động bằng bi. Như vậy đề bài người ta hỏi ly độ là hỏi chữ x khi pha dao động tức là nguyên cái góc này nè. Đúng không ạ? Nguyên cái góc này là bằng bi. Như vậy các bạn thế vào 5 nhân cos của pha, pha là nguyên cái góc này cos của bi. Và cos của bi bằng trừ -1, trừ -1 nhân 5 ra trừ -5. Vậy đáp án đúng là đáp án A. Câu số 4. Một chất điểm dao động điều hòa có phương trình như màn hình của các bạn quan sát. Tại thời điểm 1 giây ly độ của vật, như vậy các bạn chỉ việc thế 1 giây vào cái đây thôi. Được chưa? Do đó cos của 10 bi nhân 1, đúng không? 10 bi là số chắn rồi thầy bỏ đi. Vậy cos của bi chia 3 thôi. Cos của bi trên 3 thì nó sẽ bằng 